So let me just review before we kind of begin in worship and music. Let me kind of review. If you haven't been here before, we've been doing a series on spiritual formation and some of the elements in that. I just want to take a little time to kind of catch us up because later on we're going to be talking about the word and spiritual formation and what part the word plays. But I just want to mention a few things about where we've been. You guys on the sides are going to have a hard time seeing this, but you'll hear the words. And it's actually on your sheet. So if you did receive a sheet, you're going to be looking at just kind of important spiritual formation um, kind of notes. That's probably the word that's missing there, notes. So we talked about early on in the series, we talked about really what a, the original sin was. And if you remember, Satan's brilliant suggestion, that's a tree by the way, um, Satan's brilliant suggestion was, you know that tree that he told you not to eat of? That God told you not to eat of? Well, you think he did that for your good. You think he did that because he has some plan of love for you. But Satan said no. He doesn't want you to eat of the fruit of that tree because if you do, you will become like him, knowing good from evil. Well, what's the implicit lie there? You know, when I, actually, when I'm watching commercials with my kids, you know, we're watching TV and a commercial comes up, I always tell them, okay, what's the lie here? <laughs> They're getting good at it. They're getting good. If I wear that makeup, then everyone will love me. <laughs> I go, you're right, that's the lie. Um, what's the lie here? The lie here is that God doesn't love you. You think he gave this prohibition because he loves you? He doesn't love you. He doesn't want you to become like him. He's your rival. He is your rival. That's why he doesn't want you to eat, because you'll suddenly become like him. Wow. Wow. That, that's a game changer for Adam and Eve. So what they begin to realize is, well, if he's not for me, then I have got to become for myself. I have got to find the things I need. I've got to find security. I've got to find love. I've got to find identity. So the original sin came from the failure to believe that God is really for them. And so what do you do when you don't think God is for you? You've got to strike out on your own. You've got to secure everything on your own. So we talked about the original sin is really autonomy or independence from God. And it's trying to seek a real need that we have that's legitimate for love and security. But we add autonomy to that, that is trying to seek it from somebody other than God. And that's sin. So sin is autonomy acting independently from God, which is really driven by legitimate needs we have for love and security and to live the way we should. So we talked about that early on. Sin is this kind of need plus autonomy. Well, it results from that, of course, immediately for Adam and Eve is guilt and shame. Because what are the first two things they do after this? Anybody? They cover themselves and they also hide. Hide. So the first thing to do is, is a hide and cover, because they instinctively realize, wow, something just broke in me. They feel vulnerable. They're kind of out on their own now, and they just feel naked. Of course, they are naked, but they feel spiritually naked. And the guilt now is, oh my gosh, I, I'm kind of living outside of God, and they fear punishment. And so what do we do when we fear punishment? We hide. We hide. I have a little dog, and when he knows he's done something wrong, and I say it, whew, right under the table. Okay, even somehow animals get it. Um, so guilt caused them to hide, and God's going through the garden, where are you? Um, and the other thing they do, of course, and the other thing is shame. Shame is this like, the sense that oh, I've got something broken in me, and people are gonna see it. People are gonna see this. And we talked about shame, how, how what's the first thing you do when you run up the stairs and you trip? What's the first thing you do when you trip? It's not even a sin to trip. Thank goodness, by the way. What's the first thing you do when you trip? You look around. Did anyone see that I'm a dork? If not, I'm cool. But if so, you feel a sense of shame, and of course shame makes you just want to cover. It's like you want to cover. And so this is the other thing that came originally with the original sin, that I did to cover and hide. And we as humans have spent most of our life trying to cover and hide, Try, knowing that there's a brokenness inside us and trying to find ways to cover and hide. And of course we talked about what that leads to is sometimes trying to find identities that will help us cover and hide. Things we're good at. Now these are things we're naturally good at. These are good things. But what we're trying to find often with these things is how can I be successful enough? How can I be funny enough? How can I be seductive enough? How can I be um, uh, athletic enough? 
How can I be insightful enough? And we find these things that we're good at that are good, but we try to crawl completely inside them and find our identity in them because we need a place to cover and hide. We need a place to feel like we're good. And of course, because this is happening all apart from God, it's what Paul calls the flesh. The flesh is simply our human power to try and save ourselves. That's what the flesh is in Scripture. It's just our human power, which is weak. (laughs) Our human power can't save us from guilt and shame if we're acting outside of God. Only the cross can. And so we said that what happens in our lives then is we have this sanctification gap, what's called a sanctification gap. We know the law says we should be up here, and the law is good. The law said we should be behaving this way, we should be in this way. But really, we realize I'm here, and that's what causes us to cover and hide. I, oh, I should be praying more, or I should be doing all these things. And the law is meant to kind of show us this gap and to drive us continually to the cross, to fly to the cross. Instead of trying to cover and hide our failure, spiritual failure. And again, that's kind of us trying to seek security apart from God. What we do is we continue to try and find it, even as Christians, try to find it, can I be a good enough minister? Can I be a good enough, a kind enough person? And so even within Christian, we keep trying to find some identity apart from God to save us from these feelings of brokenness. We talked about really what we need to do, every time we need to experience the gospel. In that moment of shame or guilt that may come daily, that sense of spiritual failure, the first thing we want to do as we repent is we want to fly to the cross and say, Lord, my identity is that I belong to you. Thank you for the cross. And in fact, spiritual, spiritual, spiritual formation can be thought of as the whole process of letting the gospel go deeper and deeper and deeper in us. And so as we do that, and as we open to the thing, instead of hiding our stuff from God, as we open the truth of ourselves, yeah, we, we have sin, and we continue to, and we have needs. As we open that, what Scripture talks about is what we're doing is we're opening the heart. Because the heart is where the action is. This looks like a person wearing a cowbell, but it's supposed to be a person. Okay? Because what's, what's going on in the heart is the Holy Spirit's not only there, but all of our disordered loves, all of our attachments, all of these identities we tried to grab, the heart we talked about last week is where the action is at. That's where the Holy Spirit wants to grab us. Because in our heart is the, is the, thing, the things that need to be healed. And so what we want to do in, in, in our life with God, if guilt and shame cause us to cover and hide from him, we don't want to do that. We fly to the cross, which opens us up, because we have no fear now with God. There may be sadness, but no fear. The cross is taking care of guilt and shame. And so now we're free to open up and talk with God. What is going on? Because the heart drives our life. And we talked about Proverbs 4.23. Watch over your heart, because you know what? From your heart flows your entire life. <laughs> Whatever is down here in the deep, whatever disordered loves or attachments you have or sin, whatever you have there is going to drive your life. You know a lot of biblical truth up here, and that's fantastic. You need that. But that truth needs to get down into your heart because your heart drives the boat or the car. So we talked about the importance of attending to the heart and that sin is often just a leaking of these things out of the heart. And I showed you the picture of the glacier that we think of sin sometimes as just, we should think of sin as kind of these moments when the glacier kind of pokes up above the water, but really what's happening is that glacier goes down deep, and it's what's happening in our heart in which we leak. I don't get up in the morning saying, oh, I think I'm gonna sin today. I think I'll sin robustly today. No, I get up in the morning thinking, I really want to abide in God. I want to be a loving person. I want to receive love from people. But something happens, we get a trigger, a little bit of competition, a little bit of envy, a little bit of anxiety. And whatever's in our heart almost gets triggered. It's like it gets punctures at that moment and our sin comes flowing out. We don't intend it to, we leak. We leak what's there. Well that's, you know what? To notice that, to pay attention to that is such a good thing. Well Lord, wow, there I was again. I was leaking, Lord, what is in my heart? What is it you want to me to open up deeply and to, and to seek healing from and, and to repent from deeply? And so sin is not usually an intention we devise in advance. It is something that is there and leaks. And so what now, now what we're going to do in our series is look at, well, how 
can a deep transformation take place? If sin really is autonomy from God that's lodged deep in the heart, even though the Holy Spirit's there too. Lord, what is the path? And today we're going to talk about the word and spiritual formation. What is the role of the word? How can we read the word in such a way that we can be transformed deeply? And so that's what we focus on this morning. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up and just lead us in a song, a couple songs, just to open our heart, just to begin this morning. And so I want you to come with these songs, and I want you just to sing, but I also want you to kind of open to the, the words and to what degree they express your heart this morning. So why don't we all stand? So the word and spiritual formation, um, how is it that the reading of the word can actually touch the heart? Now you guys are in school, and uh, we're following the command to let the word renew our minds. Um, And so you're going to classes, and you're studying hard, um, and our belief is that we really do need to renew our minds, that we need to understand the truth in order for the journey to take place. For the Hebrews, however, and and the Greeks who followed, like Paul, uh, who, you know, he was Hebrew, but he he was was, uh, absorbing also kind of a Greek view, the mind was in the heart. See, for us, we tend to think of the mind apart from the heart, because we think of the heart as emotional, and the mind as cognitive. But for the biblical writers, the mind is in the heart because as we looked last week, most of the references to the heart in the scripture talk about thinking. What is in your heart is what you really believe. What is in your heart is what you scheme. What is in your heart is what you devise. Your heart directs your steps. What is in your heart is your memory. The heart was the word for that nexus of will, intellect, thought, and affect, and emotion. But it turns out the references to the heart as purely emotion are far fewer than the references to the heart as the place where we ponder things deeply. The heart, according to Proverbs, is who we really are, our entire eternal world. And so when we say we want the scriptures to renew our minds, for Paul and others, this meant renewing the heart, because the mind is in the heart in biblical thought. And so it returns us back to this question. How can the reading of scripture in our lives really, how can we really allow it to affect the heart? Well, again, it's supposed to. Uh, I've quoted the top of the page here, Hebrews 4, 12 to 13. This is a fantastic verse. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrows, It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I mean, this is reading the scripture as open heart surgery. (laughs) That's the metaphor here. The metaphor of a sword that's going into the deepest places, joints and marrows, the stuff that holds us together. Well, that's a good question. What is holding us together? The scripture comes in and says, a kind of good reading of scripture, good openness to it, it'll actually judge, it'll evaluate the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. You see, we think of scripture primarily as just a source of truth. But here it is a source of truth about ourselves. It is what we call a double knowledge. It gives us a a knowledge of God, but it also gives us a knowledge of ourselves. Read the verse. The scripture's job is to judge the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, to awaken us to what really is happening in the heart. And it goes on, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Well, if God sees it, we want to see it too. Everything is uncovered, laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. See, God calls us to come out of hiding, to come out of hiding and covering. And and a kind of of, uh, important reading of the scripture is to open the truth of ourselves, because the scripture wants to come in there and do a little open heart surgery. It takes that sword and open up the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And the scriptures also want to show us what we really believe. If you have your Bibles, you might flip over to 1 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14 to 16. Here Paul says, the natural person, that is the person without the spirit, does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are folly to him. 
and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. He says the person who doesn't have the spirit, they can read the scriptures, and you know, they can kind of get it. Oh, like I need to be a good person, I need to not lie. I mean, it's not that they're, I mean, let's face it, it's not they're completely without understanding. A lot of people who aren't believers acknowledge the Bible as an important moral, uh, as an important moral teaching. But what he's saying here, they really don't get it. <laughs> they don't understand it. And in fact, he goes on to say, the spiritual person, on the other hand, the person who has the spirit, that's what spirit, spiritual means, by the way, is, is with the spirit. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understand the mind of the Lord as so to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So what the spiritual person can do when they read the scriptures is we can kind of, not just kind of get what the sentences mean, but we actually spiritually appraise them. We understand them. We, in other words, we value them. The spirit in us reads something, and we not only get it, but ideally our heart should go, yes. Yes, and you've had this experience. You've been in chapel, you've been in a church service, people preaching the word, and inside, you're not just kind of getting the sense of it. Your heart is going, yes. I believe and value that. Well, that is, what, that is where we want to be. Because, of course, we have these beliefs in our head, these doctrines that we do believe are true to some extent. But, you know, that's a kind of our conscious theology. You and I all have an unconscious theology. And this is what's in the heart. And on some days, our unconscious theology is going to say, well, yeah, you believe in your conscious theology that God is sovereign. But your anxiety right now, your really high anxiety, tells you that you've got another belief going simultaneously. God is not sovereign. God does not love me. And so we have this unconscious theology, and so part of us may be kind of saying yes when we hear God is sovereign and loving. Part of us is saying, I'm not sure. Well, the scriptures are meant to go in and show us the truth of ourselves. Again, we have the cross, remember? There's no condemnation here. There may be some sadness. There may be some kind of, gosh, I wish I were at a place where I really believe this. But God, I have to tell you, honestly, I'm not sure I do entirely yet. Part of me does. You know, scripture is like that sonar on boats when they send sonar down. And you know how sonar works? There's sound waves that go down. And when they hit something, you get a little beep. We just hit something. Well, truth is like that. Scripture reads scripture. It sends the scripture down. And if you and I truly in our heart believed everything as a spiritual man does, which is yes, yes, then there would be no beeps, right? There would be no beeps. (laughs) It would just go all the way down and be clean. Well, you and I have beeps. You and I have areas of our hearts where, yeah, you know, I consciously, I do believe this, but unconsciously, I realize that in my heart there's still some unbelief. And it's not that I don't, you know, it's not that I don't believe it. It's just that I have some, some needs and fears and wounds that have generated some unbelief. And so when we read the scriptures, sometimes if we really kind of be honest with God, it's like, I get it, I get it, I get it. Beep. Oh, there's a part of it I need to grow in. Part of it I need your healing in. So the scriptures are meant to open that up. And of course, if you think of Jesus' parable of the soils in Matthew 13, the scripture is good. Right, the, the farmer is pitching the seeds. It's pitching the seeds. That's great. But what does the kind of change depend upon, to some degree? It depends on the soil. That's a parable. It, it's sometimes called the parable of the sower. But I think better translations have the editors put in parable of the soils. This is a parable about the soils. That some soils have in their heart this kind of stuff that chokes it out. It doesn't really get to the heart. Or it's shallow or rocky doesn't really get to the heart. And so ideally, a reading of scripture is one that goes to the heart. Otherwise, we risk our biblical understanding and learning, we risk being shallow Christians. Where we kind of have studied enough just to learn the insights and the principles. But we end up being a little bit shallow as people. Because we haven't let the understanding come into our heart and given ourselves as a whole person to this truth. Well, it's designed to do that. So the temptation, now I'm on number, Roman number three here, the temptation is going to be, while you're in college, and while you're studying these scriptures, which is so good, it is so great to be in a place where you can learn scripture, the, the, the danger will be that it will become only academic. 
And I know this just, hap this just happens. I mean, how could it not happen to some degree? I mean, you've got exams, you've got tests. I've got to read Ephesians in the next 45 minutes. You know, <laughs> um, it, it's just going to happen. You're, just, you're, you're archiving information. You know what? That's cool. I mean, you're here to archive a lot of information, right? You can't process everything deeply. That's impossible. <laughs> so that's cool. The danger will be that becomes all you do, is you're archiving Bible knowledge. That'll be the danger. And the temptation will be not just that, not just the archiving of biblical knowledge. The temptation will be to do it apart from God. Because me remember, this original sin is autonomy. Autonomy means independence. Our danger will be reading the scriptures apart from the Holy Spirit. Because remember, Hebrews says the Holy Spirit is living and active. Why is it living and active? It's just words on a page. The scripture is just words on a page. Unless, unless there's a person behind those words, within those words, driving them into our heart and opening our heart. And in fact, there is. At the top of the page, John 16, 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. So it turns out that reading the scriptures is dealing with a person. It is dealing with a person. Christianity, I write here, is not a philosophy, nor even just a theology. Christianity is not just a philosophy, and not just a theology. It is fundamentally an encounter and relationship with the living God. So the danger, the temptation for you will be to dis disconnect the word and the spirit while you're in school, and even afterwards. Your tendency will be to kind of read the scriptures, get the principles, get the insights, get the truths, but not really admit the Holy Spirit into your reading. Because the Holy Spirit wants to go to your heart. The Holy Spirit has something for you in this. He wants to take it to your heart. And our danger will be to kind of miss that and develop a relationship with the Holy Scripture in which our Trinity becomes the Father, Son, and Holy Scripture instead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so the scriptures are so good and so true, but we also need the Spirit to interact with those and to choose us. We need a deep reception. We need a deep reception of the scripture. And again, if you think of the parable of the soils, that is what that is about. How do we read the scriptures in such a way that we raise the probability that this will be a deep reception, an encounter with a person not just with principles, not just with truths, which are all true. The law is good. But how can we read the scriptures in this way? Well, take a look at the next section, uh, section four. The scriptures has a word for this kind of reading, and it's called meditation. It's called meditating. Look at the passages. Psalm 1-2. This person in which the psalm book opens, the blessed man or woman, their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. From the beginning of the psalm book, the theme is, this person meditates on the scripture. Psalm 48, 9. Within your temple, O God, we meditate on your unfailing love. Huh. Within your temple, we do this particular thing that we call meditating on your faith and love. Look at Psalm 63, 6. I meditate on you through the watches of the night. And again, notice this is a, it's not just a scripture, it's a person. This is Jesus speaking to you in the Gospels. This is the Holy Spirit speaking to you in the Scriptures. I meditate on you through the watches of the night. Psalm 77, 12. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Now, not just the Scriptures, but on your works, on history. I'm going to meditate on you through some of these other sources of revelation, general revelation. Joshua 1.8 the command is, do not let the book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. So what is, this, what is this kind of reading or what is this kind of thinking that is meditation, that has a greater probability of taking the scriptures into the heart where the action is at, where the truth of ourselves is? What is it? What is meditation? What is scriptural meditation? Well, it turns out there's other, the same word 
is used for other things in the scriptures. Same word as meditate. Isaiah 31, 4. As the lion growls, that word for growling is the same root word as meditate. Back to my dog. I gave my dog a, I bought him a little Biola bear from the bookstore. It's now his favorite chew toy. The stuffing is coming out, which means the end of a chew toy. But he really loves it. And he will sit there and wrap his little paws around this thing, and he'll like, <laughs> He just kind of growls. And the image here, of course, is not of my dog, but of a lion kind of gnawing a bone, and that kind of purring inside. He's, he's gnawing it. He's chewing it. He's ruminating on it. He's licking it. He's, it's the same word from, as meditate. It's this kind of chewing. It's this kind of deep pondering. It's also the same word used of a dove moaning in Isaiah 38, 14. That deep, I don't know if I've heard a dove moan, but I've heard doves, you know, like, Am I doing that well? Is that why you're laughing? Or are you doing that stupidly? Okay. It's that kind of deep, something's happening in the deep. There's ta- something, I don't know what's happening in a dove, I have no idea. But it's the same word that suggests something out of the deep. These next two examples aren't exactly the same word, because um, the Hebrew word and it's not uh, the transliteration is not into Greek is not the same, but it's the same activity. We're told that when when Mary received the word that she was going to have the Son of God, she pondered this in her heart. She pondered it in her heart. In Ezekiel three two, Ezekiel eats the scroll. <laughs> he eats it. Also in Revelations 10.10. So meditation is somehow taking this into your deep, having the space and having the openness to take the scripture into your deep in a kind of way which you chew, you growl, you you moan, (laughs) you, you long for, you take it in your deep. So there is apparently this kind of relationship with scripture that is a depth relationship. Well, Again, that may not entirely answer the question, how is this done? Well, that is something the Holy Spirit has to guide us in, but if you flip your sheet over, I'm gonna introduce you in the last few minutes now to one kind of approach to reading the scripture that has become really time-honored in the history of Christian spirituality because it is attempting to put this into practice. This is not, uh, you know, this is not the only way to meditate on scripture and to ponder deeply, but it's turned out to be a really helpful way And of course, in Colossians 3.16, we have a similar command. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. That's another great kind of metaphor for this depth relationship of scripture. Let it dwell richly in you. And so this practice called Lexio Divina, or divine reading, was a practice developed to try to apply that command. How do we let the word of Christ dwell richly? How do we let it get to the heart? Um... Well, if you could throw up Stetson, Psalm 42 real quick. The first, um, and there are four movements to this. And so I'm just going to kind of very, very quickly teach this to you. We don't have much time. We have about four or five minutes. But very quickly teach this to you. As what you might do to use, uh, to use in your own kind of scripture reading. And this is assuming, by the way, that you've probably maybe already studied this passage. So you've already studied it. This isn't exactly Bible study. Hopefully you've had a chance to study the passage to understand the author's intent, to understand it in its context. But now you want it to go deeper. Now you're ready. Your biblical study has prepared you to open deeply to it. So in the first movement of Lexio Divina, we simply let God get our attention. We often, um, often those who practice it, would just read the passage out loud sometimes because take it in not only with the ear, but take it in with the mouth. And the, and the, I'm sorry, not take it with the eyes, but also the ears. And sometimes you would read, your, read it aloud or simply read it several times in any case. And this is called kind of the lexio or reading part of it. And indeed, Ben kind of, as he was singing Psalm 42, he directed you to that. He said, you know, as you read, just begin to let it kind of get your attention. You're trying to kind of pull away from your other concerns and you're reading it multiple times. You're kind of becoming wet with it. You're kind of becoming exposed to it. You're opening it up. You're, you're getting yourself into it. And what you begin to do is what Ben asked you to do, is you might even begin to notice a word or a phrase that is for you. You're reading, you think, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul, and you're reading this, and suddenly, suddenly a word or phrase 
comes out. Um, I pour out my soul, maybe. For some reason, as you're reading it, as you read it several times, you go, why am I drawn to that phrase, I pour out my soul? You may not know yet. But the belief is that the Holy Spirit's beginning to direct you, perhaps. And so as you read it, this first, first several readings, you're just thinking, what is kind of drawing me to this? And, and for some reason, today, with Psalm 42, even though you may meditate on it for many days, for some reason today, it's, I pour out my soul. You don't know why yet. But then you go into the second phase, which we call meditation, or you could also call it pondering, like Mary pondered, is to now take that word, phrase, or sentence that has caught your attention and begin to chew on it. Lord, what's going on with me such that this is standing out? And this is the place of honesty. See, this is the place where you really want to open your heart. And you might continue to do a little Bible study in your mind, like, you know, what does the word mean, or what does the phrase mean? But you don't want to use that as a defense against going to the heart. <laughs> you don't want to intellectualize it so much that you kind of go, okay, I'm done once I figure it out. No, you want this to go into heart, so you begin asking questions. Lord, why is this touching my life? You know, it could be because it's been a long time since I poured out my heart to God. And the scriptures begin to say, you know what, you haven't had this experience lately. And you begin to talk with God about that. And why haven't? Have I just been too busy? Or actually, am I scared of some of the stuff in my heart? Or maybe I believe I pour up my heart, you won't do anything about it, because I've got some serious stuff in my heart, Lord. And so this part, you actually begin to have a conversation with the Holy Spirit over the scripture. Because you're opening the heart, and you're saying, I do long for this, but I've been resisting it. Maybe that's the conversation. Or maybe the conversation is, I just feel like doing this again today, Lord. I'm going to pour out my heart. And, it just, and it's, everything's cool. You just pour out. I'm going to pour out. I'm going to right now pray. And so in this meditation part, we are letting the scripture bring up these things that are in the heart. We're letting it do what Hebrews 4.12 is, which is address the heart. The next part is prayer. And here's where I'll just say, you know what? Scripture reading and prayer should be pretty much the same thing for us. In order to keep scripture reading from being done in autonomy... Scripture readings just lead to prayer. So maybe I've begun to realize that I, I resist pouring out my heart to God for whatever reasons. And now a prayer starts coming up with me. Lord, I want to be free with you to pour out my heart. Lord, help me today to be absolutely transparent. Lord, help me to be absolutely honest with you. Maybe that's the prayer that's coming up. Your response might look in other ways too. Maybe you're going to to uh, draw a picture of, I mean, the response can be so many things here, and this is the response part of the reading. Lord, how do I want to respond to you? It could be application, but not just application. And finally, the last movement of prayer is what's called contemplation, and that shouldn't be a scary word, because contemplation means just sitting with God at the end, because so many of us, when we open the scriptures, we get an insight, we get a truth, we get a principle, we close them and say, I got what I wanted. And we kind of treat the Bible like a filling station, I kind of got what I wanted, I got the insight, I got the truth. While God is standing there and going, no, it's not just about getting the insight truth, it's about being with me. It's about being with me. And so the fourth part of this reading is when we just sit down and we open to the presence of God. That he is there for us through the scriptures. Well, I encourage you to actually, as a prayer project, if some of you want a prayer project this week, take a verse of scripture or a passage, maybe eight to 12 verses, that have been following you around lately something that's been kind of on your mind, and spend five days meditating on that passage. This can be done in 15 minutes, it can be done in an hour, depending on the time you have. And just begin meditating, take that one passage that's been following you around for a while, something that's kind of got your attention, and just practice this, and just open up the heart. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.